Middle Path Radio, your number one online Islamic talk station. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Brother and sister, welcome back to Middle Path Radio. I welcome you all. Um, Middle Path Radio usually, um, Obi Moti starts on the, in Bengali, but today again we're going to do it in English. And we have a great, and I'm so happy to have um, Jonathan. He's going to be a doctor, so um, <laughs> I call him Dr. Jonathan. Um, this is going to do doing his PhD now, so it's amazing. Um, Jonathan, um, last week we had, um, just to give you a b- brief what we've been doing. Last week we had a um, British champion boxer, and he's a young man, and he's Bangladeshi. I was quite proud to have that. Wow. S- and a week before we had um, Captain Nick Koch, and that was amazing. And before that we had... Um, Councillor Mahbub Alam, you met him before. Um, it's great to have you today. Um, you. Welcome to Middle Path. Um, I'll ask Jonathan to introduce himself. Um, I'll just give you a clip of what he was. He's, uh, he was a teacher in um, Ameri- Arab American University in Jenin, also in Lebanon. So he knows that area so well, and he's doing his PhD now. Um, Jonathan, if you could introduce yourself and say the things you've done in Jenin and Lebanon. Okay, Please. thank you. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, everyone, and thanks very much for inviting me, Ishaq, on the show. Um, I, yeah, my name is Jonathan Smith, and I'm uh, originally from the U.S. You may be able to tell by my accent. From Atlanta in the southeast in the U.S., so uh, the home of Martin Luther King, where he was from originally, uh, the civil rights hero, and also a very famous place for uh, hip-hop music. So uh, Outkast, Usher, uh, a lot of uh, music uh, and hip-hop comes from, from Atlanta, and also a lot of very greasy uh, food as well. So it's, uh, um, I, I'm, I've been living in the UK for six years now. My wife is uh, my wife is British, so she helped to bring me to this country. Uh, but before I was there, I, as Ishaq was saying, I taught um, for four years in the Middle East, and I was teaching English at uh, at two universities: one a Palestinian university and one a Lebanese university. And at, through that, I had the opportunity to meet a lot of um, Palestinian and Lebanese students, and also feel more a part of the society there. Fantastic. What's it like living there? I mean, how does the people live there and how is the relationship between Israelis and uh, Palestinians? Could you yeah. No, thanks. That's, that's, a, that's a good I'm question. I'm sure you um, have a lot of students from the both sides. Yes. Well, I, um, the university I was teaching at was, this is uh, in the years I was there, it was the years of 2002 to 2004. So it was about 10 years ago now. And that was during the Second Intifada. And at that time, there were, the area that I was living in, there were no, um, is, the only Israelis who were able to be in the area that I was were soldiers. So only students and the people that I interacted with were Palestinians because of the, the situation at the time. Um, but the, uh, the, the place, it was such an um, amazing place. It really changed my life living there. And one of the things, I mean, it's going to sound silly to you, but, you know, I've read, I read a lot about uh, the, what you know, we call the Holy Land and growing up in the Bible. And when I went there and I first saw... Um, the first place I went to was an internet cafe, and I was surprised that they had internet is it, is it because you know <laughs> Bethlehem, isn't it? It's a place called Be- Bethlehem yeah. where the Jesus was born. That's right, Bethlehem, yeah, which is in the Holy Land, and of course Jerusalem Al Quds is also in the Holy Land. Um, so I had no idea what the place was like, so I was just surprised, you know, that the that it was. In fact, they had better, faster internet in some places than where I was from. So you know, I was really, uh, and my students had nicer phones than I than I had, you know. So I was very very surprised about this, but the 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 thing that really um, amazed me about living there <clears throat> was the the welcome that I had from the people, uh, from Palestinian people. And I was also thinking coming as an American, and we know the, the history and the current situation of American foreign policy in the Middle East, and thinking me as an American going to this country, the people are going to be suspicious of me, or they're going to be at least not friendly, you know, they will be, you know. But actually, I was so welcome and made to feel at home. and. Every every night, someone invited me to come to my house and have dinner, so and meet my of, family. What kind of stuff they ask you? What kind of stuff they ask you? Because well, they trust yeah. you and they like yeah, what kind of stuff yeah. they ask you. They well, ask the first yeah, the first thing that I was always always asked because people love to talk about foreign policy is. What do you think about at this time? The president was President Bush, and as you know, he wasn't very uh, popular uh, yeah. president in the Middle East. So they would ask me, "What do you think about Bush?" That was always the first question, uh, and then after that, we would talk about. Uh, I wasn't a big fan of him, maybe you might guess, but uh, then they would talk about. Uh, they would ask about you know what it was like to live in America. You know, is it like we see on the movies? And what was 
what's really interesting is they had the same situation like we have thinking about the Middle East. They would see movies and they would think that all Americans live in big houses and are rich and have, you know, that's 10 what cars. I think is real. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> that's, yeah. <laughs> and, and then I would, you know, and then my uh, imagination about living there, you know, that, that, you know, it's a very dangerous place. You know, you're very likely, anyone living there was likely to be killed at any moment. And my family would be very concerned about me living there because of the situation, you know, that I could be, you know, in, in danger. But actually, I was very, I felt very safe. In fact, I felt more safe in the streets in Janine than I did in the streets of my city because there's a very high murder rate in Atlanta. It's, uh, there's a lot of gun violence and all of that. So I actually felt more safe living in Janine than I did in my, my own city. So it's surprising. But, but we but still true. love American movies, though. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Can't away from us. <laughs> uh, have you met any Israeli uh, students or friends? What do they think about? I'm just talking about ground level. I'm not talking mm. about politics at all. Mm. Because to deal with politics, I'm sure Al Jazeera, the BBC, the Sky, they, they can deal right. with that. I'm just trying to find out people in the level and how do they react to each other? How do they talk to each other every day? Yeah. Do yeah. you have any experience on that or examples? Yes, yes. Well, I mean, I did get to go to some of the places in Israel and meet meet Israelis um, uh, in you know Jerusalem or Tel Aviv. Um, but I think the most interesting conversations that I had, if I'm honest with you, are with is Israeli soldiers. Um, and they were often very young people because in Israel they have a... They have to go into the army. It's required when they're 18 years old. So most of the soldiers are actually very young. Uh, and I remember a number of times having a conversation where I would go, uh, you know, go into the village and there would be soldiers who were coming in and they would see me and see like a Western person in, in the village. Like, what are you doing here? You know, why are you here? And they would often say to me, you know, it's not, you know, you shouldn't be here. It's not safe to be here. And I said, actually, I, I feel fine. I, I mean, it's not safe for you because you have a gun and you're here, you know, as part of an army. But actually, there are uh, a lot of um, Israelis uh, very often before the, the Intifada started would come in to, to Janine and get their cars fixed and shop in the markets and had a lot of very good interaction. But as soon as the, uh, as soon as the, the, the violence started at that time, then everyone was completely separated. So if you, I knew more about Palestinians than most Israelis did because they had no opportunity to go and meet them. So the only thing they heard about them was on what they see on TV. But so you had a, even though even though they were living next door, they had no chance to actually meet them. I'm talking about the young people now okay. because they would have grown up, and then by the time they were old enough to travel, they wouldn't have had the chance to actually go and and go into the West Bank, except except in a very okay. difficult situation. Yeah. Is um, uh, Palestinian are they educated the kids? Because you know, like it's been happening for a long, long, long time. I don't know how the education is. Because you, you're the person been there first hand. You've mm. seen that. You've done it. Mm. Are they educated? The kids. How do they go to schools? Or do they have enough food? Or do they have enough yeah. shopping? Do you have? Yeah. Well, I, I don't want to make it seem like that. that even though because I had a very things, good experience. Because things there, we yeah. get out, like mm. um, even from the Muslim side, I'm sure they will. Yeah. They will show it. It's, 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 it's happening to a lot. Maybe it's not the mm. case. You know, from the both sides, because it's the media. Mm. So if you yeah, no, I, I, I mean, I don't want to to make it seem. Even though I had a very good experience there, partly the, the the good thing about it for me was that I was there as a visitor and I could leave when I wanted to. But for young people growing up in the Palestinian territories, it's very difficult because they have a difficult time accessing education. So even if they have schools, maybe because the roads will be closed or there will be a military um, action in their area, so it'll be difficult for them to get a consistent education. So education is a really high value in Palestine. I think compared to the other... Uh, countries in the Arab world, it's 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 one of the has one of the highest educational levels, but the access to education is very difficult because a lot of people are have a difficult time going to school consistently. Or, I, I remember in my course that I was teaching, one of my English classes, we had uh, students. Some of the students who were coming from the city couldn't get into the university. It was just outside of the city. We had one semester where a whole one third of the classes they weren't able to attend because of military action in their area. They weren't allowed to travel. So that means they missed a third of their classes. So because of this, it affects education a lot. Mm. But I think the desire for education and also I think people see 
education as being a part of their a part of being a Palestinian, a part of a of a type of nonviolent resistance to go and to be educated and not to and to be a person to work for the, the good of your country. So there was a really strong value. The students there really love the education and were so it was they really it was exciting to be in the classroom. You may think, you know, if you're in a class here or where I'm from and even in Lebanon, it was the same. The students were sort of bored, like, oh, you know, what, <laughs> why are we here? We have to kick another, you know, another English class. But the students there, they were so hungry to learn because they knew how important education was for, their, for them to advance in society and also to, to make a difference in the world. Tell me about Lebanon, because you, there's another place where all the, everything is happening there. Too. Yeah, yeah. You have um, um, the guerrilla wars, and you have, it's, it's every day, same thing as Palestine. So tell yeah. me about them. How do they... Yeah, yeah. Well, I think Lebanon, in a lot of ways, I lived in Beirut, which is a, which, uh, in a lot of ways, I, I found similar to London because everyone is all mixed together. You know, you have people from all different backgrounds who so are Beirut sharing the same, the, Hezbollah, the same space. That's where the Hezbollah, well, maybe. this one of the cities where they're. Okay. I mean, they're, the, Hezbollah is a, has a political party, and they are in in the government, which is in Beirut. So they're involved in the government, but they also have a military wing, which is based in Beirut, but primarily in the south of Lebanon. So on the border with Israel is where, where more of their militia are, are based. Um, but I, I think for the thing that was really uh, impressed me about Lebanon is how there were so many different people uh, from, you know, all uh, anyone around the Middle East. So you had, you know, Christians, you had Sunni, Shia, Druze, uh, and some Jews as well, not as many, but some, they're all living in the same area and they all found a way to live together. Now, you may not see that on the news because on the news, what we see is always whenever there's a fight, it's the same anywhere here. You know, if you look at the news and you see, uh, you know, the top few stories, you know, this person was stabbed or this person that, and you think, oh, everyone's killing each other. But actually, most of the people are really getting along and doing a good job of it. But then you have some people who aren't, and this is what we what we see, see more than the, uh, you know... <laughs> Yeah, I think we've been so. too much around Palestine and uh, Lebanon. Can I just ask you before we go to another topic, um, what do you see as a third person? You know, because every day I see those things, it changes my mind, isn't it? Because mm. I can see people dying. But from your part, you know, as a teacher, what's the solution? What can it be? I mean, Arabs, they're not bringing any solution. Well, every time they just go around to America or uh, and come and sort this out, they're not doing it themselves. Mm. So... What do you think the solution is going to be? How do you, how would the solution come? What do you yeah. think? Well, I'd, I wish there was there were a quick answer, like a five second answer <laughs> that would be you know that would solve solve everything. Um, I I I do, um, I do think, and this is this may surprise you that when I first arrived in the country, I remember I lived there for two years, and I first arrived, I thought, oh, this is really simple. Here are my here, I have a five step plan that will solve the conflict and then after i lived there for two years i felt more and more like i have no idea you know it's it's very very complicated because there are so many interests and so many you know so many you know our areas of power at play different countries have their own interest in there and also you have two people living on a very small bit of land trying to figure out how to share it with each other so i don't think there's a there's a, a simple solution but i think i found the some people who were really working for that together and that's what really inspired me because it's very difficult it's it's very it's easier to work for peace if things are okay but if things are really difficult uh, i had friends who um who had family members who had been killed in the conflict and they were working every day tirelessly to try to have more peace in between christians and muslims in palestine and also with israelis and palestinians outside of outside of the West Bank. And I think that's actually what makes a difference is that people, we don't wait for the government to fix things mm. because the government, uh, we can't depend on the government to fix things. If we want to fix things, I think if we want to make things better, it's a responsibility on us to do everything we can ourselves. And I, it's easy for me to say that because I'm sitting in a nice, uh, a lovely flat in yeah. London. So I, I can't say that. But what inspired me was seeing people there who that's what they did. They spent all of their time working to create a situation of peace and to work for justice as well, because both of those come together, peace and justice. They can't happen separately. So working for justice and working for peace. And uh, I had some really good friends who did um, 
they did protest against the building of the wall that was being built in between the West Bank and Israel. And some of it was being built, um, as you may know, uh, on Palestinian land. And there were people who would go every every week and some of them every day. And they would be Palestinians and Westerners and Israelis. And they would go and protest and they would have to face fear ga- uh, tear gas and beatings. And they would go back every day, every day and keep and keep working to, to fight for justice. And in some ways being very successful. So th- those kind of people really inspired me because that's the people who are making a difference. They're not waiting for the government to fix things and they're not just blaming other people. They're saying, let's get involved, let's make a difference here. And that's that's what I think is the, the, the only way that there can be a, a solution. Brother and sister, the ones that are watching, I'm sure you are very warmed by the things you can hear by now. Um, today's show is going to be amazing. You stay on. Um, I think I'm going to move on to, um, just to make it quite balanced, um, I know the Israeli are doing things they're doing, they have their own reasons. Um, but if you go just beyond, if you go to Syria, if you see what Assad is doing to their own people, you know, it's, who's better than who? If I, I, I could say a scream every day, that's my first, that's my opinion. I could ever say, look, look, they're killing us, we're Muslim, because that's why they're killing us. That's the easy, easy to say. But is, is Assad is not a Muslim? See what I mean? So it's happening everywhere. It's, if a crime is crime, you can't move away from that. And if you see Middle East now, it's, it's Libya, Egypt, and it's, it's happening everywhere. So I think we can't blame it anymore to others. I think we have to take a step where we should look for humans, uh, the ones that are quite level-minded. Uh, this is what Middle Path is trying to look for, those kind of people. That's the reason I'm just trying to get out from the politics, because so, as soon as you go there, uh, the one party is going to be happy, others going to be not happy. So we're just going to get, uh, get out of here. Can I just ask you, you said uh, uh, you're from an area where there's a lot of singing happening and stuff like that. Do you sing? <laughs> no, a a oh, little bit, but not, uh, sure not very much. I do that in the bathroom. A lot of things my wife would say, <laughs> yeah, stop it, stop it. Yeah, yeah. In the, yeah, in the shower, that's it. No, <laughs> okay, I, okay. I, I'm not, uh, no, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm a great, I, I love music, but I'm not a, I'm not okay. a great singer. <laughs> you won't say nothing for them, no? <laughs> okay, yeah, I think I'll that's... leave that out then, no problem. <laughs> Do you do cooking? I do cook. Yes, yes. Um, I, I really, um, I, I love cooking Middle Eastern food, um, but the uh, like Palestinian and Lebanese food. Um, but the 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 challenge with this food is you you always have to cook for at least eight Even people. Your food you know, is can't see. Lebanese, yeah, this is right. <laughs> I mean, American food. It's uh, you know hamburgers and uh, you know uh, you know usual. I, mean, I can do that, but it's nice to cook something that's uh, the Middle Eastern food that really that other people can eat. You can have a big meal and get people so around to, to share. What's your favorite? Well, my favorite um, my favorite dish to to cook is a dish um, a, a Palestinian dish which is called maklube. Maklube is an Arabic word that means upside down. So it's basically a dish with chicken and rice and many vegetables, and you cook it uh, together in a pot. I'm sure if you if you look it up on Google, you'll find it. It takes a really long time to cook, but once you cook it, you have to then turn the pot upside down, and uh, then it comes out with the chicken on top and the rice and the on the bottom, and it's uh, it's called uh, it's called maklubi. It's, it's a it's a great, but it takes about three hours to make, so you have to have uh, you have to have some time for this oh, to make no. it. I never tried it. to. I don't, know. I, don't know, I don't know how it works when it's upside down. I don't know how it looks as well. <laughs> um, Jonathan, I think um, just going to go back to um, it bugs me all the time. In Second World War, we see, if you go to the list, you see 80 million, 60 million people died in Second World War. If you see, if you list them all up, it goes to more than billions of people. And humans are killing humans, isn't it? It's all made for killing. It's like a killing machine we are, you know. So how do we come out of this struggle? Um, yeah, wow, that's... <laughs> That's good. I mean, that's really important. And I, and I think um, I, I just want to build on what you were saying earlier about the um, the kinds of violence that we see uh, in the Middle East between different in different places in Syria and in, in Lebanon and Iraq uh, in you know, in, in Palestine and Israel. I, I think um, it's very easy to to look at another situation. And this is what I learned to think we, we know how to, to fix it. But I think the key is to, to look at where do we see violence and where do we see injustice in our own country and what can we do to make a difference? And I think that's, that's um, I mean, I, I think obviously 
that governments are involved in this, but I think there's a lot that we can do as people. So when I was, uh, I went to visit um, an imam of a local mosque in uh, a town, Kabati is in a town, a town close to Zababde where I was living in, 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 the, in the West Bank. And I um, was if, if trying like to. to say hello to you, oh yes, yes. You. <laughs> <laughs> well, my my friend, um, uh, I have a really uh, good friend who was the best man at my wedding, um, who's from this uh, village, Iyad Abu Rob. I'll, I'll show you watch, but but the um, um, the the um, the sheikh, he he, um, I I was asking him, you know, what can I do if I really want to support Palestinians? I want to make a difference because I really think, you know, the situation is bad here and I want to, to want to do something to, what can I do to help? You know, this is something a lot of people ask. And he, what he said to me is really surprising. He said, I really appreciate that you're here helping us. That's good. But you can do a lot more if you go to the West and try to make a change in the situation in the West, because it's, it's all related. You know, we can't, uh, we, we live in a world that's connected and we can't, uh, you can't fix if there's a, there's a famous saying that um, Martin Luther King had, which is my, one of my favorite uh, sayings, which is injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And when he said it, he was talking about the Vietnam War um, because he, he got involved in trying to convince the US government not to be involved in the Vietnam War. And people said, why are you doing this? You're supposed to be working for against injustice against black people in the US. Why do you care about the Vietnam War? It's thousands of miles away. And he said, this is his answer was, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. If we don't work for justice where we live, it doesn't it doesn't matter what happens somewhere else if we can't also make a difference in our own in our own country and i think that's the, that's the thing it matters what happens in vietnam it matters what happens in palestine it matters what happens in london and in atlanta and we can all do something to work for that uh, work for a, you know a better so what did you choose life. to do a um, phd in faith what's yes the, so yeah what's the reason <laughs> it's good good question yeah um I, yeah, i'm doing a, i'm doing a phd in uh, um theology and religious studies and the the subject i'm looking at is about christian muslim relations so how christians and muslims relate in the middle east and also in the west and seeing what kind of similarities and differences there are in this in this this kind of thing so i'll be doing some work in uh, the middle east and some work in uh in the uk to kind of look, look at both and and i think it's because my experience of trying to, to be being involved in interfaith work in palestine and in uh and in london made me think about what are the things that make it work you know because we want to do something we obviously we want to do good things for our community but we also want to do something that works that makes a True. difference. So what can we do? You know, what can we do that actually, that actually makes a difference? What helps Christians and Muslims work together well? And that's the, the kind of thing I'm looking at, um, looking at studying. So what did it's you a, find? Any, any, any well, examples like we are so, yeah. <laughs> you say Abrahamic faith is just like Christian, Muslim, and Jewish. They're, they're yeah. similar. Because yeah, you're doing yeah. that, do you have any example for our audience? Of the, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I think, I think one one thing that that's really similar about Christians and, and Muslims, and I, I'm a Christian, as you may have been able to tell, but is that we both really believe that that the truth is important and that it's for everyone. It's not just for our group. Every everyone should know the truth, and and also we have a responsibility to make the world a better to make the, make a difference to the world to make the world a better place. Uh, and I think it makes it work. Christians and Muslims can meet together a lot in doing projects to improve our community. And uh, that's what I, I actually found in, in to be true in Palestine, is that that was uh, it was because we share the idea of faith, we believe in God, we believe in one God, and we also believe that it's that he, he makes us his stewards to make a difference in the you know, to to make a positive difference in the world. So that's something that I noticed that was similar between uh, between being in Palestine and also being being in London, um, but I think the 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 thing is that we have to work with uh, with everyone. So sure. work with churches and mosques, but also work with uh, people who don't who aren't involved in religious groups. We have to kind of work the, the the bigger a group you have together, the more kind of difference you you can make. So that was uh, that's a couple of things. But I'm just I've just started my study, so hopefully, inshallah, in a couple of years, I will have more. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure. I'll, I'll look for you. <laughs> more, things, yeah. more things to share. Jonathan, um, let's go back to America again. Okay, yeah. Is that a fair comment to say Americans have not been fair with Muslims? Is that a fair comment? I, I don't find it, I don't find it, um it's fair to say it straight away like that yeah. because they're there to help. You know, like um, uh, in Syria, 
They didn't want to go. So Arabs went to them and took them there. Yeah. So they're playing yeah. a big role there. They're playing a role everywhere else as well. If you take them out, say in their position, you put Russia or China and stuff, how, what would, how would it look like? Yeah, well, so I have to see the both side of it, good right, side and the right. bad side. Yes, yeah. they will. They're there. They they're playing a role. You might yeah. not like it. You might like it. Yeah. If if you move them away and put somebody else like Russia or China, how would it look? Well, well, I I think I think that the um two the, both things are important: intention and action. What you know, what we do is important, and what we intend to do. So I I, I do think that in in some of the work that the U.S. does in other countries, it's it's from a good intention. It's wanting to make the world better, but but even if the, the intentions are very hard to judge, I think only God can judge our intentions. You know, we, we may think we, we may think we have good intentions, but in the end, the only thing we can be judged by are our actions uh, in, in society. And so that's why I was very happy that when this uh, um, report came out a few weeks ago, the, the CIA report about the torture that the U.S. was involved in uh, in, in Afghanistan and, and in other countries, because I think all countries, we have to be judged by our actions. Uh, and if we're not willing ourselves to look at ourselves and to make judgments about our own what we do and to make a difference and to change things to be more just, then we're uh, it's then it, you know it's it does it doesn't matter if we have a good intention. Do you, do you see what I'm saying, Ashok? And I think so. I I think that's something to me that I was really happy when that happened because I think the more that countries are able to be self-critical, to look at themselves and say, look, we did something wrong. We may have thought we were doing the right thing. We may have thought we had a reason to, but it was very wrong to do it. And I think that's important for every government to do because we all uh, do things that are... Uh, I think this know, is something special. Right. I have to admit, this is something special about America. That's why they're leading the world. They're the world leaders. They do have brilliant stuff happening for them. If you see, um, they are democracy in, the, in America. And if you look around the world, you will, see, you will find totally different. Where I'm from... Bangladesh, if you see the democracy there, you'll say, whoa, is that democracy? So I can't just say finger point just because he's big and he's doing something I don't like. I can't do that. Hi, welcome back to uh, Middle Path Radio. I'm Ishak and I'm with Jonathan. Jonathan, let's go back to action again. Um, can I just ask you, because you've been in the Middle East where the Jesus was born as well, near yes. the, um, some of my friends, quite old friends, I told them you're coming today. And... Um, in the 80s, so they're quite old as well. Right. They asked me to ask you, is there anything there when Jesus was born, any, any like a stone or anything from mm. old days? And how are the Christians there in that area? Mm. That's, that's re yeah, really good. There's, um, uh, because the, the pl there are a lot of sites that are around um, the, pl the place where Jesus is born, for example, there's a church um, called the Church of the Nativity, and it's supposed to be built on the site where Jesus was born. I think for these things, it's hard to know for sure if it's, you know, exactly, but there's a cave you can go down in the bottom, and it's supposed to be underneath the church, and it's supposed to be the kind of area where... You know, we don't say Jesus, Jesus, we say Isa. Like Isa, uh, Isa, yeah. Isa, so just, just to, oh, no, yeah. thank you, thank you. Isa, 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 so that that's so, um, so you can go and see that see that place and, and a lot of tourists go there you know all the time in in the year um so there are a lot of buildings that a lot of churches where christians will go and pray and will go to see as pilgrims you know our pilgrimage and christians usually we would go to go to jerusalem go to bethlehem but the palestinians palestinian christians who are who are in in palestine they call themselves living stones because they are the ones who are still there from the time when Jesus was there that are still carrying the faith up until now. Uh, and um, they have a very, uh, they can have a quite difficult life because of the political situation in, in Palestine. So in a sense, they share the same challenges as being Palestinian, um, but also they're Christians. Um, so so uh, they're uh, really, really beautiful people. And I've really enjoyed uh, getting to know them when I was in uh, in Palestine. So what's the number of Christians there in the area? What's, yeah, the, what's the number you think? Big number? Oh, it's good. Number? It's quite, it, it's become smaller. It, it had, it was, um, I think they used to be about, um, around sort of 20% of the population, maybe about 50 years ago. And now they're about 3%. So it's a and much, can I ask uh, you on one more thing? Are they, yeah. are they Catholic? Are they Protestant or are they Jehovah's Witness? Which, all, one, which, which group are they, they? All of the above. In? I mean, they tend to be the most, most are, are either, um, Eastern Orthodox is the largest, uh, um, group traditionally there. Um, 
but uh, an Orthodox Christian, and then also Catholic, and then there are some Protestants. So what's, you have a what's mix the of, difference? Any, any, uh, well, Eastern, yes. Knowledge. So, so the 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 Church um, in the 11th century, the the Church in the whole world split between East and the West, and the Western Church was became based in Rome, which is where the Pope is. So the Catholic Church is in charge of basically the Western Church. So the, where Palestine is, is what's considered the East. Okay. So that so the Eastern Church is called the Orthodox Church, now it's what people call it, but it's sort of the, the Eastern. So so the Palestinians are between, some are Catholic, some are Eastern Orthodox, some are Protestant, so from different uh, diff- different groups. But they're they're quite small, but they're a very important group. And, and I think um, also for um, uh, the Muslims in Palestine, they're very proud and they're very... Uh, supportive of Christians who are in who are in Palestine because they see them as being a very important part of their heritage people they like to say that Jesus was a Palestinian and so they like to think of it as uh, you know that they're they're kind of brothers and sisters together and as as Palestinians okay just um, just for my own knowledge um, when I go to see a friend of mine and he's got a picture in his in his bedroom and um, it's like this is a Jesus. So he's got a blonde hair. He's got a long hair and stuff like that. So <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I don't know. I know it's just people made. It. I'm sure they don't have a picture in it. But does it give you a right impression? He, yeah, he, no, he looks no, like yeah, a, no. um, <laughs> European now, isn't he? Yes. Yeah. No. That's true. That's true. There's a, there's a, another place in uh, a famous place to visit for Christians, which is called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and it's it's uh, it's supposed to be the place where Jesus was buried after the the crucifixion. This is of course in Christian in Christian teaching, but it's very close to uh, Al Aqsa and the Haram al Sharif, so it's really in the same very close close to that and in this church they have different areas for different churches from different countries so there's a there's a greek area there's an ethiopian area upstairs there's from all the, all these different churches and each of them have drawings of jesus and in each one he looks like the people from that country so in the ethiopian uh wing of the church jesus looks ethiopian he looks more african and in the greek one he looks very greek and if you go to the russian one he looks very russian so i think the this is people try to imagine Jesus as being someone they can relate to, so they draw him as a way that they they see. But in reality, obviously, Jesus was from the Middle East, uh, and we don't know exactly what Middle Eastern people yeah. looked like back then, but he definitely didn't look European and white. He didn't look like me, basically. <laughs> I think <laughs> if we... <laughs> it was, some of my friends will say, <laughs> because I've got a beard, and a lot of nowadays yeah. you, you see a lot of... Um, um, every day in the papers... Mm. I just I think I downloaded something here. Every in the papers in America and in UK in everywhere they're talking about Muslim terrorists, Muslim this, mm. Muslim that. If you have a beard, the people suspicious you if it's going to something going to happen to you. Mm. You would be shocked. My after 7/7, seven, seven, my wife got into the bus. And um and she was a man got up in the bus and he had a bag on. You know right. like those bags. Yeah, yeah. And she was scared. The woman said, "I was really? scared. I was thinking is it got anything in his bag?" Hmm. Even she's Muslim, she's scared of yeah, that. Yeah. So that's normal thing will happen because it happened, isn't it? And um, so when they see me, they usually say, "Oh, you got a beard, you terrorist." I would say, "No, I'm more Jesus than you. <laughs> yes, <laughs> because yes. Gonna, he had a beard." Yeah, yeah, yeah. And no, it's true. He did. I mean, yeah, he definitely would have had a, would have had a beard. And, I would imagine um, we that. <laughs> respect him so much. Yes. I mean, he, we, yeah. we say without believing in him, we're not going to be a Muslim. You can't go to paradise without believing in him. And because we have so many problems ourselves. A lot of things happens against him, or, or his mother as well. A lot of things, like um, the non-religious people, anything and, and everything, regarding them. But we, as a Muslim, supposed to protect them because he is the he is the prophet we believe in. But we're busy with our own stuff. We're not protecting nothing. We think, okay, we left it to somebody else to do that, deal with that. That shouldn't be the case. So um, just to clear off, and we we'll, we we'll love him, him and his, his mother especially, and we love them more than ourselves sometimes. And we have to do that. This is the condition mm. of the faith as well. Mm. And when we say how much we love him, we say Prophet Muhammad and Jesus, we're in the same lane, we say. Yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah, that yeah. should yeah. be yeah. a good example. And, 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 and I, don't th- I don't think Christians know that as much as they should. You know, there's a lot of things we don't know about each other. And I think that's the kind of thing that, this is why I like doing interfaith work, because when you can let uh, Christian and Muslim sit down and talk to each other, then that's one of the first things that Christians learn. I remember when I first met Palestinians and they would tell me the same thing you're saying and I was like oh I didn't know I'd never I didn't realize that you know and I, I think the the there's a problem that we don't talk to each other enough 
about these kind of things. So we talk to our neighbor about, you know, uh, football or, you know, where we're going shopping, but we don't actually ask them, what do you believe? What do you, you know, what do you think? And I think if we knew that more, then we would understand each other better. It makes it easy, actually. Yeah, yeah. Once you know people, it's more more easy to... Um, relate to yourself is better. Yes. Yeah. Can I say you've been in the Arab world? They have a lot of jokes in the area. What's the funniest <laughs> thing you've done? D- can you remember one or, or ask? Well, one? I, 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 I don't. They, the jokes, to be honest, a lot of jokes are very hard to translate between different okay. cultures. You know, you can you can tell them, but I can tell you a story of something yeah, funny that happens to me. If that's if, I, if that's sorry. So. Um, uh, one time we were traveling, I was traveling, uh, most people in, in uh, Palestine, in the West Bank, they travel between uh, places in, in shared taxis. So it's like a big van, but you have maybe six or seven people in it and they're all going from one place to the other. It's called a service in, in Arab, that's what they call it. So, so I was taking a service from Geneva, which is a city, to the village, which is where the university I was teaching was. And what happens often is as you're traveling, there are um, the uh, soldiers uh, would come and set up a checkpoint. And at the checkpoint, they would stop everyone and take their IDs and check check them. And sometimes you go to a checkpoint, you might be there for five minutes or you might be there for five hours. You don't know. No. So people, of course, they don't want to go to the checkpoints. They want to find a way around them. So we were on the checkpoint. There was a tank and there was a checkpoint that was set up. And it was on this intersection of a road that you had to go through. The only way to go around it is if you could drive through the field. So what people would want to do is they'd want to go and drive through a field to go around the tank so that they don't encounter the checkpoint and can get get home. Well, the problem is that in the winter in, in Palestine, it rains a lot and all the fields become muddy. So in, in, the mud, in the mud, if you just have a van, you can't drive through the mud quickly. You'll, you'll get stuck. So I was thinking, you know, how are we going to deal with this situation? So we come up to the checkpoint. There's a big row of cars, and our driver's like, no, we're not going to do this. So he goes, starts driving into the field and gets stuck in the mud. So we're, so we're in the mud, and then you can look here, and you can see the tank and all the, the cars lined up. But here we are, stuck in the mud. And then they had a guy in a tractor, uh, and he came up to you, and he hooked up the car to his tractor, and he pulled our taxi through, and then at the end, we had to all pay him a little bit of money. And it was like a business for him. So he set up a like entrepreneurial business to drag taxis through the mud so they could get around the checkpoint. And we had to all pay him like, you know, really? two How pounds. I, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't ask. So but all the, all the, cause they said, you know, if you want to go this through the sky, we can get there quicker. Okay, fine. So we all gave him a little bit of money and we, we made it through in this way to get around. So. Is there was so I have so many stories like that of people that find creative ways to travel because you never know what's going to happen on the roads and they always come up with some kind of a creative way of getting there. So that was a really really funny. So we, we okay, have. Let, in, let me give it to you. Finish. Can I give you just one? There's yeah, an example. This is why this is to me that why this this was particularly funny because where I'm from in Atlanta we have this tradition which is called I don't know if you've ever seen they have these this thing is called a tractor pull. It's like a they get these big. They basically turn a whole stadium, if you imagine like the O2 or, you know, Wembley Stadium into a mud pit and you have to, they have a tractor and you have to try to pull cars through, through the mud. It's like a competition that people do. It's a, it's a really strange, (laughs) it's a really strange sport, but we have strange sports in Atlanta. So, so it was like a track. So, so this, this to me, I'd never experienced this before. So this is my experience of being a tractor pull. It was my first, you know, like tractor pull competition. So we were all, (laughs) (laughs) so it was like being in a tractor pull, but in, in Palestine. So I thought it was. uh, Let me give you two jokes because I have. Yes, go, please, please go for it. Sorry, sorry, it's not uh, American and um, uh, Muslim doing the fighting. I'm just trying to give him something from our side as well. <laughs> Great, no. I, I uh, a man from village. Yeah. Uh, he went to a city. He never, he never been there before. So he saw the tall building. It's massive tall. So imagine mm. Canary Wolf. He never seen that before in the village. He, he was just looking. And he found a, a fraudster. And he said, he just looking and he's counting. How many floors are there? One, two, three, four, five. One. And the fraudster said, what are you doing? I said, I'm just counting. He said, um, do you know if you count them, you have to pay. Every floor you count, you have to pay. Okay. He said, um, I have to pay? Yeah, you have to pay. That's the rule. And this is town. That's how it happens. Mm. He said, um, but the man from the village, he said, okay, I'll count. How, much, how many did he count? He said, up to five. So, okay, give me, example, 50 pounds. So the guy took the money 
and he just one of us. He made easy money. When he went, when he went back to his village, he said, "You know what I've done? I'm so smart. I counted the build the floors. I, I counted up to ten, but I told him it's five, so I saved fifty pounds." <laughs> <laughs> another That's one is yeah. Another one is you know in um, Middle East they when people used to go from um, Bangladesh to Middle East, so mm. usually they when they go there and. Um, I think they're not very healthy living there for mm. them. They just do any job and any work. Mm. So one of the guy, he didn't have this passport. I don't know what you call things in Arabs. They oh. call it botaka or I don't know what you call it. Okay, them. okay. So like a, a passport or... Something like that. Right, okay. A card or something like okay, that. Okay, okay. So he okay. didn't have that. ID card. Right? ID okay. card. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he just came out of the mosque. He prayed. Right. And the police stopped him. And he said, have you got any? He said, he said um, no. He said, uh, well, I'm going to take you then. He said, hold on, I forgot my shoes inside the mosque. I have to get the shoes from the mosque. Right. <laughs> and the police believed him. Right, right. And he said, you stay here. I'll get the, the shoe. Right, I'll come right. back. You know he's not going to come back. Yeah. He went for a shoe and he's gone home. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's two of mine. I don't know if that is good funny. No, those are, those are a lot. Yeah, well, yeah that's those, funny. Those, those, are, those are good. <laughs> okay, we've got five more minutes. Um, we're going to crush it down. Um, how do you... I love to learn your, the accent you have. American. Oh right, okay. How do you, how do you pronounce my name or middle part? How would you say it? All right. Well, the first thing I have to say about accents is, you know, where I'm I'm from uh, is the the southern part of the United States, and I actually don't. I, I've lost a lot of the accent that we have from there. So, but I I still know how to do it, but I don't say it as much when I speak. So, so the southern accent is very slow and very drawn out. So. If I were to say your name in a southern accent, I would be like E shark, E shark. So two seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would be like really, it'd be really. Okay. It was so, so it's very slow. And I, I had some uh, friends who came to visit um, us when we were in the in the U.S. who were who came from Egypt, and they couldn't understand anything that they spoke English really well, but they couldn't understand anything that. Uh, people were saying where I was from because the accent is so strong and they said it sounds like you have rocks in your mouth when you're speaking you're like it sounds like you're speaking like, I don't understand like none of the words <laughs> so that's it okay back to America again because yes. um, not many ta- I haven't met many Americans myself um, <laughs> okay America is a place where everyone looks up to it well yeah, yeah. <laughs> they deserve it yeah they deserve it so, so but okay. when we go into it we see I was just looking into it it says 222 trillions debt. Yeah. That's a big and massive. And a lot of the money is coming from China, UK, France, mm. everybody else. Mm. So is that the biggest debt or why is it like that? Yeah, that's, yeah, it is, it is really, it, there we are in a lot and of how that. And it, it's, a, it's a big concern in, in the US, I think, is the, the amount of debt. Um, I think they like, we like to compare governments when they make speeches, they like to compare their checkbooks to like uh, a person's checkbook and they say you know well if you don't have your money to pay your bills then you you don't pay you know like you uh you know you you go into bankruptcy or you but but i think um uh, it's very different you know the 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 system um and i think what's what's happened with with all of our economic systems is that in a sense because our our world is so connected no one can control the economic system so uh, so, like you said, the U.S. has a massive amount of debt to China. Um, this is because uh, they had a much more manufacturing than we did, and so in order to balance it, we uh, we had to to borrow money from them. So there's a lot of reasons for it, but it kind of I think it's a good example if you look at the economic system of how uh, even powerful countries are not necessarily in control of what happens. They have they have to deal with massive problems with debt. So I think um, pretty much all the countries are in the world are in debt in yeah, one form yeah. or another. Um, but um, but it's a, it's a very big problem. I mean, at the moment, the way that we're dealing with it is that we keep uh, printing more money, you know, <laughs> which is sim- similar in the UK. It's one way. Or other kind of ways of sort of offsetting the debt. But I think it's it's becoming, a, you know, a really big issue and something that needs, you know, that, that we need to deal I, with. I find it strange or scary, actually. When you see... Russia, China, Mexico, and um, India coming together. They do, they done a bank, isn't it? Recently, mm. they done a World mm. Bank for themselves. Oh yes, that's right. Yeah, and um, and the economy is going going higher and higher and higher. Mm. Um, and Russia recently now, regarding um, in the area, they doing a lot of they're showing the muscle again. They're going back to the old style again, isn't it? 
and showing the guns and then doing the stuff like that. I don't know where we stand if they come into the power again or China going beyond America again. Because if they have all this money given it to America, how would they go against them? Because the lot of, it was okay, give us the money back then, and it would be an issue. Yeah. And um, so we, what, do you think the balance is shifting towards Asia, or what do you think? Well, it, it does seem, I mean, I'm not an expert in economics. You, you saw my, my degree is in uh, English and religion, so I don't, really, I don't really know much about economics, so I have to say. But I, I, it, does seem of, it does seem that the balance is shifting more, more toward the East. But I, I think that's a good thing, because it's not, I don't think it's healthy for any one country or one area to have a, a, a disproportionate and an unequal amount of power because then it affects everything and how the, the system runs. So, what, you know, what we can hope is that there's more of a balance of power between between the East and the West and the North and the South. And if there is, then I think we'll have a better a better society. Now, of course, it could be more instability in the process of transition, but, you know, I, I think I think it's, it's not, uh, it's definitely not fair of that, you know that one country can control a lot of the the money that the rest of the world has that doesn't seem for whatever that country is whether it's a good country or not a good country it's better for the wealth to be spread around so you know i i think hopefully it can be a more positive thing for our uh, but our one society, thing i don't get yeah. it in my head i don't know just if you could explain mm -hmm. like they still pay one nearly one billion pound to um uh, Egypt, the army, they give yes. every year. Yeah, yeah. They give yeah. two or four, three billion pounds to the Israelis, and they yeah. give, they do quite a lot of money yes. giving it, yes. stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. How do they, sure. how do they afford that? How do they? Yeah, no. Well, we don't we don't afford it. I mean, I think that's the thing. We we don't we're spending more money than we than we create or that we get in as a country. So we're we're not. So I think it's not a not a sustainable system. It has to change. At some point, it's only a question of when and how how it will happen. Um, but yeah, that's it's a. Okay, would you like to say anything to your um, uh, the Arabs, the people are watching now? Uh, <laughs> I don't know if they're any. I, I have to yeah, no. tell my uh, some of my friends to to watch anything it. Um, that's good. <laughs> but I, yeah, I I um I really appreciate you inviting me to oh. to be on the show, and I just want to say that I. Uh, uh, you know, yeah, hi, hi to all of my friends in uh, in Palestine and Lebanon, and uh, and in uh, on different countries as well. And uh, yeah, I just hope there'll be more more peace in the world. And with with people like you and the group that you're doing, Ishak, and and other people working together um, from all faiths and uh, even people from no faith to make a better world, then inshallah, the uh, we can make a difference. Thanks for your time. I'm honored to have you. And I'm really I'm, I'm in it. Thank and um, people are watching from Palestine, Lebanon, everybody. We love you. We love you too. Yes. I'm sure you love us <laughs> as well. And um, we hope to see you again, probably another, uh, next, next time. Well, I'm sure we'll organize it quite well as well. And um, brother and sister, just before we go, um, you could see if you open up yourself, you learn and you can move on. This is a global world. It's like a village, they say. And um, the more we know about each other, and it's, it makes sense, um, and we can trust each other and we can build a good society and community and the world as well. We don't want to be doing the same mistakes we made Second World War or whatever we've done. Billion people died and we're doing that. So people who want to see a peace, let's go out and talk to each other and make the change. Thank you for your time and see you next week, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.